morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for turning up today. It is an important grand round, as you would have gathered from the emails that were going out every 10 minutes from the Education Center. Um, it's a great privilege, really, today for the Royal to have uh, Professor Vikram Jha, who has, uh, for the last couple of years, uh, been uh, the head of the Undergraduate School of Medicine in Liverpool. Um, I think we were very fortunate to get him from Leeds. And once he got here, he's uh, got about his job setting a blistering pace uh, for some of us who've been lucky enough to work with him closely. Um, and uh, Vikram uh, has very kindly come today to the Royal to share uh, what lies ahead of us in terms of the excitement and, and the newness uh, of the curriculum uh, for the University of Liverpool. Vikram Jha. Thanks, Abhan, and thanks, uh, Aftab, for inviting me. Um, what we, what I thought we would do is, uh, I'll give you, a f in a few slides, a bit about my background. It was only to spare Arpan having to introduce me. Um, uh, so it's just to give you an overview as to what I've done in the past and where I am now, so that you get some context as to why I'm standing here uh, talking about the curriculum. Um, and then give you an overview of the, of the entire curriculum, uh, but particularly concentrating on um, the clinical years, when, which will be not the clinical years, but really from years two to five, uh, when of course you're, uh, which are more relevant to, uh, to you. Um, and then I thought uh, we'd, we'd, we'd have a, 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 a little discussion on the impact that that's going to have on, on trust as a whole. Um, uh, and, and then leave you with, uh, with a bit of time for questions if you, uh, if you wish to. So, uh, so I trained as a full-time obstetrician um, uh, till about 2000 um, uh, and uh, was in Dundee uh, as a senior registrar uh, when I discovered medical education. And uh, not sure how, uh, where you are, but of course Dundee's always been and still is a uh, uh, sort of an international center uh, for medical education, uh, uh, sort of uh, pedagogy and uh, research. And uh, that's where I kind of suddenly decided that's what I wanted to do rather than um, be a full-time clinician. And so I applied for uh, an education research fellow for the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And in fact, that building was, you know, the, 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 the lovely pyramid that they have, um, a bit like the Louvre, uh, was built uh, around about the time when I uh, started. Um, and it's, it was during that time in Dundee and, uh, and, and working for the college that I, uh, that I did my master's in, from Dundee. And, and I know uh, that's, that's still stood the test of time. I mean, there are still people who are clamoring as a huge business in Dundee, um, uh, running the med ed course. Um, I then sort of uh, uh, worked as a clinical, clinical lecturer in Ozengani uh, in, uh, at St. James's uh, in Leeds. Um, and that's what the building used to look like. Now it's very glamorous. It's all uh, glammed up the the, uh, the, the hospital. Um, and I did a PhD um, at the time, um, and my interest was really in assessment of professionalism. Uh, and then moved to a single lecture post in medical education and an honorary consultant obstetrician, um, where I was for six years. And that's where all the problems started, really. In 2012, I uh, foolishly applied for a job in Liverpool, uh, largely uh, uh, thanks to Arpan, uh, who I've known for a long, long time. Um, and really, uh, uh, it jokes about, it was, it was really a, a, a meant to be a challenging post. Um, uh, the, the agenda from the faculty um, and the university was very much about providing uh, leadership to the uh, medical school. Um, and inevitably that came with uh, expectations of change management. So enough about me really, we moved to the nitty gritties and, and I, think, I think what we realized straight away was that there was a need for, for a change in the curriculum. Um, and I think there's several sort of drivers for that. Um, and I'll go through that very briefly, I don't want to go into details, but really the, the bottom line is that all curricula have, have a shelf life. Uh, so however fantastic your curriculum might be, it needs to be revised. Uh, uh, in view mainly 
uh, with the change in medical education uh, evidence. Um, and certainly what was, what was sexy and topical in the mid-90s when the Liverpool curriculum, the, the, the current Liverpool curriculum, uh, was designed and implemented um, uh, is very, was very different from what it is in 2014. You know, the evidence base has changed hugely uh, over the last 15 years. But I think it's fair to say that the feedback from students and, and key stakeholders in the NHS and research institutes was variable. Uh, and I think, I think students were um, uh, clamoring a bit more for, uh, for structure um, and a bit more teaching, I guess. Um, and that uh, was um, fed back very strongly in the National Student Survey uh, where we were performing not uh, uh, very well. Um, and I think there was a sense that, uh, that somewhere along the line, and this is not typical of Liverpool, it happens in, in most medical schools, is that when you're starting something new, there's a lot of enthusiasm um, uh, uh, amongst, uh, and we, we're experiencing that now. There's a lot of input from the NHS um, and the research institutes. And then after about seven, eight years, people get a bit tired of, 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 of the old thing. So, so there's, there was a need to reinvigorate the, um, the engagement. Uh, with the key stakeholders. And, and there was a bit of a demystifying the curriculum. And often uh, this is a problem with medical schools. It's sort of, there seems to be a very um, a, 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 a separation uh, from, from the real world, as it were. And I think often there's a, there's a sense amongst NHS clinicians um, that uh, they're not that involved. And there's this sort of mystique surrounding uh, the medical school and the, and the university. So it's ivory tower stuff that you read about. And I think there was a need to sort of demystified a little bit. And I, I don't need to tell you, I mean, healthcare has changed hugely. Higher education delivery, we are going through the worst sort of a period in higher education uh, with humongous financial uh, cuts from HEPCI. Um, and there was a, a need to develop a curriculum that was fit for purpose. So, I mean, these slides are quite busy, but I, th I think it was important to, for, for you to to, to, to know what the differences, the core principles differences are between the 1996 curriculum as it was um, and uh, 2014 one. So, so as you know, the problem-based learning was the mainstay uh, of the curriculum. Uh, there was complete integration of the structure, function, uh, population, uh, perspective, individual groups and societies and PPD um, themes, uh, and it was primarily self-directed. Uh, the, the new curriculum um, is, is more about outcomes. And I think, I think what we decided was that instead of calling it a problem-based or a traditional or a case-based or a, an outcome-based curriculum, we would say, right, this is the content of the curriculum. How is it best delivered? Uh, and, and, and have a much more of a blended approach. So there are some elements that are better delivered through small group, self-directed facilitation, so be it. And if there are some elements that are delivered better, um, uh, in terms of lectures or more formal workshops, then that's what we've decided to do. Uh, there is a spiral, and I'll, 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 that, I'll show that to you in the next, uh, in the, on the next slide. Um, and the idea is that you um, revisit the same themes uh, throughout your five years um, uh, of the curriculum with increasing complexity, um, with obviously the, uh, the, the bulk of the science being covered in the earlier years. And something about guided learning, I mean, one of the, 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 the recurrent feedbacks we were getting from the students was that certainly in the earlier years, they wanted more guidance. I think, I think the, the, the very purest philosophy of problem-based learning, where basically you, uh, uh, you kind of, uh, um, uh, it's, it's all about self-direction and uh, 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 sort of sink and swim, uh, some people might say, uh, was not, no longer tenable. I think, I think there was a requirement for guidance. Um, we were aware that we required more immersive clinical experience. I mean, again, we did a lot of work with the trust during the review period. Uh, one of the problems was this sort of uh, flitting in and out of, uh, of uh, board. So, you know, you'd have students on, say, Monday and Tuesday. They'd then go into an SSM and on Wednesday, uh, GP on Thursday. They'd then come back to the trust on Friday. And I think clinicians found that quite disruptive uh, and didn't get a sense of belonging or... Or, or, or a semi sort of uh, uh, firm structure uh, was required. Um, and inevitably, there was an increased emphasis on basic sciences. I think people were, I think some of the some of the um, criticisms were unjustified. I think I think I think it wasn't that the Liverpool students didn't know any anatomy. 
uh, we faced exactly the same situation when I was in Leeds, where apparently Leeds students knew no pharmacology. Um, uh, but it was, there was a need, I think, to make it a bit more explicit so that, uh, uh, so that students, when they got to the clinical uh, phase, actually came with the foundation of basic sciences that was required. Um, we've got a humongous problem nationally with uh, academic uh, um, uh, attracting uh, sort of, uh, uh, people to do academic medicine. Um, and therefore, we needed to re-emphasize uh, research and scholarship within the, within the course. So that's kind of the, the overarching principles. And actually, that reflected quite well uh, the, the changes that we've seen in uh, with tomorrow's doctors. I don't know if any of you have had the misfortune of reading all three iterations uh, of tomorrow's doctors, but the 1993 uh, document was, of course, one of, was the seminal document that uh, that uh, uh, kind of changed medical education in the UK. Uh, and, and, and there was a, a move uh, away from um, uh, sort of factual acquisition of factual knowledge towards uh, sort of uh, the, the importance of communication and, uh, and to some extent professionalism. The 2003 uh, document kind of got some way got in the, in, in the middle, but the, the, the latest iteration actually, and there's another one coming out just to make our lives more difficult next year, um, uh, actually t w went back to the middle ground where they actually thought that scientific foundation, uh, which of course we could have told them in 1993, uh, was important uh, uh, for doctors, has come back in a big way. Um, and so, so I think in lots of ways our curriculum uh, um, has mapped on quite nicely to that. So that's what the new curriculum looks like. Um, uh, uh, so what we've got is seven vertical themes, which are running from years one to uh, five, and they are uh, uh, grouped uh, uh, under the three main headings of tomorrow's doctors, which is uh, the doctor, scientist, professional, and practitioner. So we've got research and scholarship and the science of medicine, which is the basic sciences. We have professionalism and leadership and management. Uh, we have the patient with long-term conditions, acutely ill patient, and patient safety, which are the seven vertical themes. Feeding into these vertical themes, we have four horizontal themes, which are psychology and sociology as applied to medicine, or the erstwhile IGS, for some of you um, ex-Liverpool students here. Um, population perspective and epidemiology and evidence-based medicine, communication for clinical practice, and therapeutics. And they'll also run through the five years in, at different levels. Uh, and, and the spiral in, uh, on, on the right-hand side is, it just shows that there'll be uh, yeah, the, the, the topics that will be covered uh, as we go up the, uh, the years. And I'll run through the years only to give you a flavor. And I think, I think, I think so, so for example, the Royal is going to start taking students from year two, really. But it'll be useful for you to know um, what students will be coming uh, uh, to you with uh, in terms of their, their knowledge. So, so, so again, a comparison with the, uh, with the early, earlier curriculum. Uh, was that there were, of course, PBL modules with clinical skills, human anatomy uh, sessions, uh, and they did a, uh, an SSM, which was a structured uh, literature review. Uh, in the new course, uh, they'll be doing a six-week foundation, uh, which covers sort of the molecular, sort of cellular level. Um, and really, that's, that was important, because if you look at uh, our current uh, school leavers, they don't actually come with the kind of uh, science knowledge that you, that you assume they will often. Um, and also, we're we trying to encourage people with, uh, uh, with, 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 with sort of from non-traditional backgrounds. And I think, I think sometimes we do find people coming to year one who actually don't have that kind of solid foundation. I certainly need a little re revision of the, of the, of the, uh, of the basics. Uh, so, that, that, so that's what the foundation block's going to do. It will then move into system blocks uh, of three weeks each, which is uh, uh, designed in, in traditional sort of systems, so it's GI respiratory, uh, endocrine, uh, cardiology, and so on. Um, and the idea is that they'll cover the basic science elements of it uh, within those systems, but also the other themes will actually uh, feed into it. So it doesn't mean that they're just going to be reading science uh, or, or learning about science, but they'll also be um, discussing professionalism issues, um, leadership management, research, and so on. Uh, there's going to be clinical skills um, uh, to give you the early clinical contact. Uh, human anatomy, uh, the anatomy is compulsory. Uh, there will be um, uh, mandatory um, human uh, anatomy sessions. 
We've got some case-based learning episodes incorporated, and they are by no means a replacement for PBL uh, or another name for PBL. Uh, the idea of having case-based learning is to trigger um, the underpinning science using clinical uh, examples. So, uh, so the idea is that if, they, if they're doing a respiratory block, they'll have a case-based learning session on four or five uh, respiratory conditions like asthma, COPD, and so on, but not to look at the disease per se, but actually think of what is the underpinning physio physiological, biochemical, uh, and anatomical um, uh, sort of uh, uh, variations from normal uh, that might be causing the, the, the disease. Because what you can't go back to is the good old fashioned, uh, gosh, when I trained, it was uh, you know, anatomy for anatomy's sake and physiology and biochemistry. That's well gone. We couldn't go back to that. Year two is when you, uh, you will start getting them. And it's, it's a very different uh, placement uh, structure. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, again, um, in the old curriculum, it was again PBL modules with anatomy sessions. Um, and longitudinal hospital placement, they sort of uh, uh, came throughout the year, didn't they? To, uh, uh, and often year two students used to find, especially when they came to a place like the Royal, which is so big. And again, the Royal is typical of teaching hospitals in the country. I mean, we have exactly the same problems in Leeds. They hated going to uh, the Leeds teaching hospital in the early years because they just got lost in this massive sort of... Uh, um, you know, uh, um, hospitals. Um, what we've now done is, is because there are system blocks in year two as well, is that at the end of each block they'll come to a hospital. So they'll come to the Royal and um, uh, an entry and uh, uh, Wisdom and, and, and so on. Uh, and they'll have very targeted uh, outcomes that they'll be expected to achieve. A lot of it is about generic exposure to the hospital, um, but, but it's going to be uh, when they're doing the respiratory block, they'll be expected within the clinical skills certainly to uh, 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 strengthen their skills in terms of taking a respiratory history, respiratory examination, and so on. So it's much more structured, and there are clearer outcomes. And I'll, I'll come to the logbooks in, 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 in the later slide. Year three, um, you know, the, it, it was more about specialty placements in the old curriculum, and. Um, what we moved to is we brought medicine surgery back into year three because I think, I think there was a feeling that students used to do medicine surgery in year two, not do any in year three, and then come back in year four and do the finals at the end um, without doing much medicine surgery in year three. So, so in lots of ways, there was a need to bring that back. Uh, and what we hope to do in the new curriculum is use years one and two together as one uh, entity and years three and four together, kind of almost going back to the good old phases uh, which, which most of us abandoned about 10 years ago. But, uh, but, but, the, but the reason is that the, the, the students can actually see exactly what they're going to be doing through the course of the four years that they're going to be here. Um, so in, in, in year three, they'll be doing uh, blocks of placement. Now, these are full-time blocks. They are not going to be doing anything else in the four-week block that they're going to be doing surgery, for example, apart from the surgical um, uh, uh, block. And I'll, and I'll explain why. So they're going to be doing medicine, surgery, women's, uh, children, uh, mental health, neurology, GP. Uh, we've got some elective placements, which are two-week uh, placements um, um, in medicine and two weeks in surgery. Uh, that is uh, going to be student-selected, so they could choose um, what they want to do. So there's a, there's a, each of the trusts has come up with a, uh, with a list of uh, specialized areas where they think that they could take one or two students uh, um, uh, just to sort of give them a taste, uh, as it were, of specialties, and uh, two reasons really for that. One is to give students an opportunity to work in areas uh, that are not traditionally represented in the medical cur curriculum. We just can't represent all specialties; it's just not possible. Um, and the other is that you know th it could help them make career choices. The other thing we've got is consolidation weeks. One of the big problems uh, was that students would go away uh, into, the, into the placements and not come back to the university at all from the, the year three to five. And what we've done is after every four weeks, we bring them back to the university for a week. Uh, and we call these consolidation weeks. And I'll give you an example of what kind of content will be there in the consolidation weeks. But the idea is for them to get structured teaching, uh, not only in the themes that are not necessarily covered that well on placements, uh, but also on core clinical um, uh, sort of cases and, uh, and conditions that we, that we can't rely 
uh, on the ad hoc chance that they may or may not experience those. So, so I think what we've done is moved away from the KCE um, concept. I think all of you are aware of KCEs in logbooks and how difficult it was for some students uh, when they turned up at hospitals which didn't have those KCEs happening in their trust because they didn't do that um, uh, procedure or whatever. Um, uh, but we're making sure that the core uh, uh, elements will be covered in the, in the consultation weeks. They've got a long research project in year three, um, so that's again uh, filling in with the academic, um, fitting in with the academic uh, theme, um, and there'll be assessment at the end of year three, which is not going to change hugely. Um, um, so there's still going to be written assessment. There's going to be more workplace assessment um, uh, through the e-portfolio, uh, and of course there's going to be an OSCE at the end of year three. Year four is exactly the same as year three. Um, the only difference is uh, we've got an oncology palliative care block of four weeks because there was no oncology um, uh, in the old curriculum uh, in explicitly. Um, so it's just made sense to merge palliative care uh, with oncology. And of course, Clatterbridge, uh, um, they, they were very enthusiastic in, and then they heard there were 320 students in a year and they collapsed. Um, uh, so they, what they've said is they'll start taking them gradually, and then once they move to the Royal site, it'll become a bit easier for them to, uh, to take them. And they're gonna do the electives at the end of year four. We haven't changed finals. They're still gonna be at the end of year four, and they're not gonna be hugely um, uh, different from, uh, they, they, it'll be different because the course has changed, but the, the pattern is gonna be the same. We've got the uh, prescribing skills assessment, which we're hoping to introduce um, as a mandatory part, because that's the way we're moving nationally. Um, uh, in, uh, in year four. Year five, again, not hugely different. Uh, what we've got is, uh, we've got an eight week student project block. Again, the idea is that they, the students could decide that whether they want to do a SAMP kind of uh, um, um, eight week block or whether they want to, um, wanted to do a lab based research project, for example. Um, so it's just giving them a bit more uh, uh, of choice. Um, the SAMPs remain, work driving is still eight weeks, uh, and we've got an acute care block for eight weeks. There's Erasmus opportunities to go to, um, uh, to Europe. Um, similar kind of assessment is, of course, they do their SGOTs um, in, in year five, and of course, the assessment's still going to be through portfolio. And just an overview of assessment, really, I think there's gonna be, um, uh, and that's really the direction of travel for in medical education is that less emphasis on summative end of year type of assessment, more on ongoing assessment. Um, and uh, uh, we, we're designing more and more of these. Um, themes authentically assessed, I'll put that there because um, I think things like IGS, and I think people who've, who've been Liverpool students here um, would know, would recognize that immediately. Things like uh, uh, sociology, um, it doesn't quite lend itself to MCQs. I mean, it just doesn't work. Uh, and I think Paula, who actually leads the team, recognizes this. So we're hoping that that's going to be assessed more authentically in clinical workplace, but it's actually more relevant as to why you should take a social history um, uh, from a patient. More workplace assessment. And we've got an, uh, an old singing and dancing e-portfolio um, uh, that we um, uh, are commencing this year. Um, and it's actually, uh, gosh, it's, it's been hard work uh, because what we couldn't do is just take the foundation tra uh, uh, portfolio because it didn't quite work. But what we've done is actually use that pretty much as a, as a, uh, uh, as a template to create our own portfolio. So, so, people, so clinicians who are going to be assessing students on placements would be quite familiar with the, with the, the style. Uh, and the idea is that they would have their own handheld devices, which I've been out providing. All students now have smartphones. Um, and they uh, would be able to be assessed at the time um, of the, or, or indeed if they've had a clinical encounter, uh, the supervisor will be able to sign them off um, on the on the, you know, on the uh, handle device. So there's none of this paper transfer taking place. So hopefully that should make it much more streamlined for people. And also they'll be able to uh, allow us and the students to gauge exactly where they are, the direction of uh, travel as it were, through the five years. If we introduce it in year one uh, and they'll complete it for the five years, it will also make them very, very equipped to deal with the e-portfolios when they're in postgraduate. Okay, now comes the exciting bit. Um, I don't know, is this a point where I could take some questions if you wanted? I mean, um, are there any burning issues? Yeah? 
or we could do them at the end. Okay, let's move on to impact on trust, which I think I think is important. Um, so I've got some pedagogical sort of uh, issues um, that 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 the trust will uh, uh, will need to sort of negotiate. Um, the the positive is that it's going to be outcome based. So I think we were we are, we're often sort of um, uh, criticised for, um, and again, not specific to Liverpool, um, that that students turn up to clinical placements. Students are not aware of what they're meant to be doing there often. Uh, the clinicians are not aware it's because job and clinicians often are not that involved in the, uh, in the curriculum design and therefore don't necessarily, why would they, uh, know the details of the curriculum. Uh, so they don't, they're not quite sure how to pitch their teaching, you know, what level to pitch it, what is the, uh, what is the existing knowledge that students are coming with. So this time we are much more clear that both the clinicians and the students would know exactly where they stand when they go to a clinical placement. Um, and we've, we've tried to still devise um, ways of doing that in a coherent fashion. There is a there's a clinical curriculum, uh, and I'll give you an, ex uh, an example of that. Uh, so what we've done is worked with the trust, um, uh, so working with the sub-deans and uh, the members of staff, uh, to look at the bare minimum uh, types of activities. And, and we've moved away from saying, oh, they should observe a patient with breast cancer. Uh, which was very, very difficult. It's more about more generic competencies. So, uh, you know, uh, participating in a ward round, uh, 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 participating in a, in, in a handover event, uh, MDT, so m broader uh, uh, clinical experiences, um, uh, so ward shadowing and so on. Um, and what they see within that, of course, um, uh, maps on to the curriculum that we have. So, uh, and because it's a spiral, the advantage is that all conditions don't have to be seen in a year. Uh, in a yearly fashion. So, so, so I had, uh, so for example, if we say, oh, you've got to see a six week neonatal check in your third year, what happens when students don't see it? You know, so they get into a panic because they haven't seen it and they haven't got the logbook sign. Now they've got another opportunity in year four, another opportunity in year five to do that. Because as long as it's all recorded and uh, uh, by the end of year five, we're happy. Okay? And if it's not, it's not the end of the world, really. It's being a bit more flexible uh, with the system. Um, students in year three will come with, uh, 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 and, and, and uh, this is not with a much more uh, stronger knowledge, I think, uh, and I hope, of the basic sciences. And I don't think, as you, I know that they're coming with it, because actually we're covering it in a much more explicit way in the new course than they did previously. Um, there's going to be block placements, as I said, for clinical immersion. And I think that's been that's been the big winner, I think, with the NHS Trust. I mean, the, the, they've really embraced it, all the trusts, because suddenly they realize that, okay, if they're doing surgery, they're going to be with us for four weeks. And we've left it to some extent. We've given them, we've given each directorate and each trust some guidance on what we would expect. And certainly there's, I come to that in a bit, is, is, is that there's a set of lec um, tutorials that they'll be expected to, um, uh, to uh, deliver. And, uh, at the trust, but, but basically what they do on a day-to-day -day level would be um, uh, dependent, reliant on what the trust uh, can provide, really. I mean, it was stupid of us to be that uh, didactic about uh, what kind of clinical experience they would get, because of course it, it varies from trust to trust, and, and, and so to some extent the ownership's gone back to the trust, which is good. Um, and as I said, we've got the e-portfolio now to, um, to monitor it. You don't need to go through the details. I'll just put that in to say that we've got an introductory week in year three where we're going to cover all the themes. So we've got things like workshops on, the, on recognizing the acutely ill patient and, and how to escalate uh, referral and, 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 and manage them. We've got uh, workshops on the uh, patient with long-term conditions, things about shared decision-making, informed patient, and so on. We've got therapeutics lectures. We've got uh, small group sessions on... Uh, uh, on research, um, professionalism, and so on. So all the themes are actually covered in the introductory week. And the consolidation weeks, again, follow a similar pattern. So we've got workshops put in for the acutely unwell and the uh, chronically ill patients. So we're covering core competencies that we would expect students to attain. Um, and in addition, the other sort of uh, themes feed into it. Um, and, and it's a packed schedule, really. I mean, we've had to actually we, 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 can't, we couldn't fill it in uh, with, the, with the stuff we wanted to do. So, so I suppose the advantage of having year three and four together is that we've then said, right, okay, it doesn't matter if we can't cover everything in year three. There's still room for revisiting some of the 
issues in Europe for. Um, so that's how it's going to work. And actually, from the trust perspective, it's, 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 it's a real opportunity. What we're going to now do is try and get uh, clinicians, uh, because a lot of these sessions are being run by our, uh, our GP tutors who are employed by the university, uh, or the UCCTs, as the ex-Liverpool uh, students would know. Uh, but we're very keen to involve more acute trust uh, people. And the role is, is, is ideally, uh, and apart from the fact that you are our, our main partner hospital in terms of uh, being the teaching hospital, um, and also the geography makes it easier. So surgery and medicine, they'll be doing at Chester, Arrow, Entry, Wiston, and Royal. Um, uh, all students will go through Alder Hay uh, Women's and Walton to do the Neuro um, uh, Women's and uh, Pediatrics block. Um, and uh, I've talked about the elective placements which are being offered to them. Um, and we've combined psychiatry with uh, sort of community. Um, so it's, it's more of a long-term mental and physical disability block which combines psychiatry with uh, primary care. Very briefly, um, the aims of clinical experience, this kind of discussion we've had with, the, with, with, with all the trusts is that you know, the, 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 there's a need for them to be there. I mean, what the, if, they, if they're there in the morning and not there in the afternoon, and I know there's patient visiting hours and so on, um, uh, then, the, the, then there's a problem. And it's a problem in postgraduate med uh, medicine we know. Um, and we were trying to create a kind of like a pseudo firm structure, so at least students had some sense of belonging. Uh, and also they, they could actually see what's happening to the patients um, uh, uh, throughout their sort of journey within the hospital. So, uh, so there's ward activity, outpatient activity, clinical laboratories, um, and theater, uh, very relevant. Um, uh, there's a lot more clinical skills, and we, 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 what we've got is a clinical skills curriculum, because in the, in the past what's happened is that the bulk of the clinical skills was taught in year one in the university, and by the time they got to the year three, clinicians were wondering that nobody examines this way, you know, there's a university way of uh, examining, and there's a, the real way of examining, and we were tired of that kind of comparison. The students were fed up. So the idea is for the clinical skills from the trust to work very closely with the university clinical skills. Um, and in fact, if you look at things like neuro, which was the biggest uh, complaints used to come from Walton, uh, they are gonna come from year one and help out with the clinical skills teaching in the university because they, they think they can do it better than anybody else, which is fine uh, and fair enough. And, and I think it's just, it's just trying to sort of bridge the gap rather than saying, and the students used to be petrified because they had this OSCE way of doing things which they had to do in clinical skills. But of course there was the big wide world which was doing it in a completely different way. So we're just trying to sort of merge those boundaries. Uh, there's much more pharmacology and pharmacy uh, teaching. Lauren, who's here, um, is, is, is of course a lecturer here in, in, pharm uh, in pharmacy. Uh, and we have uh, poached her for one day a week to try and uh, make it much more explicit through the curriculum uh, about, of, of, of safe prescribing. Because that's again one of the key areas nationally. Uh, for undergrad um, education. And of course, the, um, the idea is for leadership in clinical governance. Um, and I think, I think they're best uh, learned experientially rather than uh, through 20 lectures on how to be a fabulous leader. And I think the ePortfolio will allow them to reflect on leadership things that they've seen, for example, examples of good leadership they've seen, or indeed poor leadership. Um, uh, so it's, it's learning through experience, right? And for students who think they'll just be hanging about um, in during clinical placement, that's not going to happen because what we've got is, is, is timetable clinical school sessions. Uh, we've got the uh, CCTs are our community teachers who are employed by the university. They always evaluate really, really well. And the students just love it, uh, being taught by clinicians, funnily enough. Um, and uh, what we've got is, uh, is the, the university tutors will actually come to the trust and work with the trust uh, clinicians uh, to, to run tutorials on specific topics. The rest is sort of just a, a mixture of things really, which was just happening, but is, was not necessarily always very structured and varied a lot between trusts. I mean, that was one of the big problems we had uh, was uh, people would go to a trust, which did very structured kind of teaching, and then they'd go to another trust. Um, and it didn't mean that the quality of experience was any worse. It was just the students perceived that as an issue really, because they said, you know, uh, such and such trust they get formal teaching every Thursday afternoon and we don't get it in this trust. So it's just trying to bring some kind of a, uh, of a, of, of a, uh, a coherence to the whole course. 
And as I said, we've got, we've got a list of tutorials. Um, I think there are nine or 10 in year three for, for medicine block, four or five for surgical block, which we will expect uh, to be delivered at the trust. And um, we, we, with our help, of course, what we've done is we, we're gonna provide you uh, with the cases uh, just to use as a starter for discussion. So the cases are gonna be there and then you can build around that uh, to cover the topic that we, uh, that we, that we need. Um, we, uh, in each of the four week blocks, um, they'll get two days for research. Um, so they'll continue doing their longitudinal year three project. Of course, uh, this is here, um, uh, 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 Polly's gonna test my um, recall ability here. Um, this is a thing that, um, that's that been there for a, for a long time and um, uh, in the livable curriculum. And uh, funnily enough, uh, uh, Richard Griffiths was the, ended up being the only one really using it in, in year five. And it was about, um, about what students are meant to do when they're on clinical placements. It's, it's very much, it's called carer. So it, the, the idea is that in the earlier years, um, uh, uh, the focus should be really about collecting information, so taking a good history, uh, being able to analyze the information that they've, that they've just taken, uh, rationalize uh, you know, uh, 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 why um, uh, you know, the, the patient's presenting in that way, what could be the underlying uh, pathology. Start thinking about differentials but not focus too much on treatment. There's no point really in that earlier year. Of course, there's inevitably gonna be a little bit of that, um, but not details of, of therapy. As they go up, they then start thinking about, uh, about evaluating the information and reflecting and, and moving more towards a, uh, you know, how do we diagnose this patient and decision making with regards to management. So it's that kind of spiral that, uh, that seemed to be missing because you, suddenly you had second year students who turn up to the hospital uh, and the clinicians would expect them to know how to manage um, um, bronchogenic carcinoma because that was, of course, one of the KCEs that they were meant to do. Uh, so it's getting away from that. So, and the clinicians will be told that, look, students are not expected to know the management of this stage. They're only supposed to be taking good histories, getting an exposure to the differential diagnosis and how clinical practice works. So hopefully that will bring more structure to the course. Okay, so that was the pedagogy of it. The organizational uh, bit is, is, again, I've talked about the shared responsibility, and I think, I think that's the big difference that this review has made, is the immense engagement we've had uh, from the trust. It's actually been really, really uh, reassuring. I mean, we, we, we did a massive curriculum review. We went to all the trusts and ran sort of different kinds of uh, uh, World Cafe type of events and grand rounds, and the response has been tremendous. And people have actually given time out of their own hands because we all know how stretched the NHS is uh, and how uh, uh, terrible the managers are. I hope there are no managers here um, for letting people go. But, uh, 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 but uh, you know, but people have actually taken, come on the annual leave to, to help us out. Um, and there's gonna be greater input from the trust, as I've said. One of the big problems we've had is quality assurance. And this is not about going to, by and large, students have, got a, have had a good experience in clinical placements. Um, but it's how do you monitor the quality? And, and I think it works both ways because what was happening was that the students would, 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 would say good things about a, tr a clinical placement or, or, or bad things. And of course, it was never fed back. It was kind of fed back on a very ad hoc basis. Clinicians would sometimes complain about students not turning up, but there was no mechanism for it to be fed back really because it would be tried, it would, people would try and sort of sort it out locally. What we've got is a much clearer QA mechanism. Now, I've got a slide that actually gives you an overview of that. What we also have is a attendance monitoring. Now, this is a, a, this is a nightmare. Uh, but what we're hoping to do from this year, when the new cohort comes in in the new year, in the new curriculum, is start monitoring the attendance using uh, electronic swipe cards. Um, and I think this is, it's a professionalism issue. Uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, if students in year one can't be bothered to turn up for lectures, and I know that it means that we have to up our level uh, in standards of lectures, because of course if your know, lectures are crap, nobody's gonna turn up. Um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a two way system, uh, but we are gonna monitor the attendance and the trusts will be, uh, who are already doing it um, uh, through uh, signing in and signing off. Uh, it'll be through a swipe card, but actually being a little bit more adult about the whole attendance. Uh, uh, so, so there's no, automatic expectation that students will be here from eight to five, for example. Uh, because if they don't have anything for in the afternoon, why can't they just swipe out and go home and do some reading? Uh, so I think, I think we've got to be a little bit more mature about how we monitor the attendance, especially in the later years when people are. 
and biological students are very keen to attend. Uh, there's, there's a handful that are not, and really should we have all our mechanisms geared towards that 0.5% who won't turn up. And they could spike and run off, couldn't they? So, um, you know, you can't, you can't uh, uh, have a system that just caters to them. Um, and better transfer of information. I think that it's been a problem in the past. We've, have, we've had students who are in, in, in trouble because of personal uh, um, reasons or, um, and, and we were not allowed um, to, to pass that information on. There's huge confidentiality issues, of course, and we've got to recognize that. We've got to take the student's uh, consent and say, look, I mean, if you need a support uh, mechanism, is it okay if I inform the sub-team at the Royal or the or entry, wherever they're going, um, that you need that extra support? And you can discuss the details with that. I think most students in the past, I mean, I used to have that system in Leeds. Most students are more than happy to, uh, to, to share that information. So we're working on that quite a bit. Uh, and that's, sorry, you don't need to know the details again. The idea is that, uh, that we've actually got a lead now for trust quality uh, teaching, Kathy Davies, um, who uh, is going to actually spend more time. But one of the, the sort of real startling things uh, that we realized when we were doing these uh, was how erratic the presence of the university was in the trust. And the trusts were delivering the bulk of our curriculum. You know, we were just delivering the first year effectively in the in the, in the old curriculum, and then the trust took over from year two, and yet our presence within the trust was not that visible. So I think Kathy's role is very much about going to the trust, meeting with the students and staff to make sure that there's some dialogue um, uh, happening between, between the two. Uh, and, that, that, and, and that will work really well in terms of uh, gathering feedback. What the vets do, and they do it really well, is, um, is, is have focus groups for students at the end of each big placement block. And you can have it over lunchtime. Uh, instead of asking students to fill endless, endless, endless evaluation forms that are never looked at, you can say hand on heart, 90% of them, nobody has the time nor the energy to look at, really. Uh, and students get really, really irritated, quite rightly, by that, because, you know, what's the point? So it's better to have more focused feedback rather than this sort of random, you know, uh, continuous feedback. So, so hopefully that will bring the two. Uh, partners to work closer together. Financial implications, I thought it would put it in. For, for the job inclination, actually, there are no financial implications, really. Um, but one thing that, that um, often I, I meet uh, my clinical colleagues who say, you know, why should I teach? Uh, what's in it for me, really? Apart from the fact that, because most of them do it for altruistic reasons or because actually they're interested in teaching students. Uh, but the, 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 the reality is, of course, there's a huge amount of money that comes from HE Northwest. Um, now, um, which follows students. And that's a, that is eventually going to be a thousand pounds per student week, which is some of money. Um, and uh, so actually that's the reason why they should be. So there are places, uh, and we've had these discussions with Manchester, for example, where of course uh, there have been consultant posts, uh, because the SIP money used to go into this massive uh, black hole uh, within each trust. They've been consulting jobs created out of that money, and so you know it's all to support this service delivery, which is great. So the argument, of course, is hang on a minute. You had five consultants in your director uh, in your department last year. You now have seven. That's not from set money. So you, you do one in seven on calls is one in five. Therefore, you should teach. So that's the kind of approach that Manchester have used. Now uh, I know Arpan um, has reassured me that the, the the Royal has moved in a. There's been a huge shift in in, in and, and there's. Uh, easily identifiable SIF money. Sorry, I happened to put you in this spot, but you've told me this and I'm gonna um, uh, reiterate it here. So we now have some sense as to where the money's going, which is very useful. And I think it's not about penny counting. I'm not gonna come to the uh, executives and say, look, you're getting 20 million. What are you doing for our students? I mean, I don't think it's got to be in done partnership, but it's, it's trust where clearly there's a huge divide between the amount of money they're getting in and the investment into undergraduate education that really poses a, a challenge for us. And, and, the, and what we're doing is, in the, in the new academic year, we will be going out to the finance directors and the chief execs and the medical directors saying, look, you, go, you guys are getting three million a year. Your budget for clinical skills is 1,000 pounds a year. You have a 0.2 member of staff in clinical skills. That's just not good enough. And I think HE Northwest is very keen on that kind of approach. Because it's a, it is about quality assurance, and if trusts are not willing to engage with us, then the students will go somewhere else. 
Um, and, 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 and trust me, there are, there are I, there's a, I mean, places like Chester are very, very keen to take students. So they'd have a took 30 students, but this year, you know, they've said, hey, we'll have 10 students for medicine and surgery because we can actually provide them with a good experience. So I think, it, I think a bit of competition will be good. So individual clinicians, um, I think there's opportunities for greater uh, uh, contribution. As I said, there's been a huge amount of um, um, enthusiasm. Uh, and I think people wanted to be, get involved. Uh, and this not, includes not just uh, consultants, but trainees um, uh, and, 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 and SAS doctors, and indeed any clinical staff. So you know, it doesn't have to be limited to medic, medics. You know, so there are, there are senior nurses who are involved, um, um, and, and there's an opportunity there. Um, and I think one of the things we are trying to do is encourage people to get honorary uh, contracts with the university. I think uh, when I worked in Leeds, it was automatically given to you once you became a consultant. There was an honorary, honorary senior lecturer post. Here it's been very, very competitive and sometimes quite onerous and difficult to, to get that. But I think what that does is it bridges the gap. It, it provides you with a, 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 with, a, with, a, with a title and also access to things like university libraries and gives you some sense of ownership that actually the med medical school is actually yours, not just mine. Um, ownership of, for students, I've said that you, they'll be there for a block so you'll be seeing them more often rather than them sort of zipping in and out of the, of the placements. Uh, clarity of expectations I've talked about, there'll be, uh, you know, outcomes will be quite clearly uh, much more visible uh, and I've got training more than that. So. Uh, as, a, as a point, because I think I think I think a lot of times I don't know how it happened in the role. Actually, it's the, it's the registrars who end up doing a lot of the formal teaching um, because they are around um, on boards and things. So I put this there here as a as a uh, as, as a kind of another, uh, as a parting shot. Really, um, this, uh, 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 mentioned this morning what my uh, what I wanted to do really with the new crew. We are really hoping that we bring this back. Now it's it's it's, it's it's difficult to predict that, isn't it? But, but the, the philosophy is that if you, um, if you didn't make any changes, then you are where you are in lots of ways. Things are not just going to happen overnight. So, so we had to make the changes. Whether that ends up uh, bringing us to the top of the, uh, of the Guardian League, we are, we, we, are, we are last on the Guardian League teams this year. Literally, number 31. Um, and we've been hovering around 27, 28, 30 uh, in the last five years or six years, I think. So, um, and, and there are various reasons why, uh, why that happens, but I think part, uh, a lot of it is because of the National Student Survey. Students are not happy when they visit uh, uh, Liverpool Medical School. Um, and so, so I'm hoping that that's gonna change. The, uh, and, and we've got a broader view of how we're gonna change that by enhancing the student experience and ensuring the excellence. And I think, I think the new curriculum reflects best evidence practice uh, in, in, in lots of ways. Um, we are hoping we're going to contribute to the, uh, to the workforce that's going to be fit for the modern NHS. Whether the modern NHS will remain the same in five years' time, who knows? But we can only do what we know now. So we can't, we can't uh, uh, predict what's going to happen in five years' time uh, uh, with the health service. But at least at the moment, it's got to be fit for purpose. And the curriculum has to reflect the changes that are taking place in the, in the health service. And of course, the continual engagement. We've done a big engagement exercise with our, uh, with our, um, uh, during a review. But I think I think it doesn't it can't stop now. It really has to be continual. So I've got this. Um, uh, we've taken sort of uh, giant steps, I think, towards um, improving uh, things in uh, in Liverpool. After that, that's what the giant looks like. Uh, uh, yes, you can see it tomorrow when you come on for your own call. Um, uh, and um, I think it's, it remains to be seen whether we're going to achieve what we will. But I think I think we're in the right direction. I think that's really quite positive. Um, I'd like to end by thanking, I've got, I've got colleagues in, in front here. So I've got Kerry uh, Colby, who, uh, who's, uh, who I poached from Leeds, um, uh, uh, much to the annoyance of my ex-boss, uh, who's our curriculum development uh, lecturer. He's done a huge amount of work uh, in, in getting this uh, curriculum. Um, uh, we've got Pollyanna, uh, who uh, uh, sadly or not sadly is now leaving today. It's the last day she's going off to Canada to, uh, to be eaten by the Grizzlies. Uh, one hopes, um, uh, who's worked with us for a year as director of MBCHB, but has made a humongous difference, I think, and worked really hard. And Marina Anderson, who people might know, is a clinical academic in aging and chronic disease consultant, rheumatologist at Aintree, who's taking over as MBCHB director uh, from 
today, I guess. Um, and, and Lauren is, uh, everybody knows Lauren, she's the pharmacist, uh, and of course Alpha uh, is our patient safety lead. Alpha and, uh, and, and of course Linz and uh, you know, the, the, the admin staff have done a lot of work in getting this together, so it's so a big thank you to them. And uh, yeah, onwards and upwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ikram. Um, we'll open for questions, and uh, ju just uh, uh, before we open for questions, just to um, for those colleagues who are here, if you could spread the word, because obviously this is going to mean a lot of change for for all trusts, and indeed for us, and we've been planning for it as well. Uh, let me uh, reassure you, but we are recording this session and it will be available on the Trust Intranet link very soon. Uh, and we'll also make the presentation available uh, to, to colleagues as well, so if you could just spread the word. Thank you. Thank you. Vikram, um, thanks very much for uh, revamping the uh, curriculum. I think as surgeons we'd be very happy to see a bit of return to basic science. Um, so I've got, I've got two things, one, a couple of points. Uh, one is to do with the service reconfiguration that's uh, come across our new specialty uh, in vascular surgery. Uh, so vascular surgery now is in two hospitals here and Chester and nowhere else. <laughs> and uh, we'd be a bit worried that the average medical student wouldn't come across um, you know, uh, patients with peripheral vascular disease. Uh, and and we, we cover, we're going to cover the pathophysiology of atherosclerosis, you know, which you know, kills most people in the UK. We're going to look at venous disease and venous thromboembolism and prophylaxis. And we're going to cover things like disability, <coughs> critical limb ischemia and amputation. And we're a bit concerned that, I, I, I don't remember being asked about the, uh, the curriculum for, for vascular specifically, maybe because we're you know, just two years old. But it's got to be here, or it's got to be in Chester, one, one or the other. So, so, and now I'm just going to give my little moan. I've been a consultant 21 years now. Every single year, about four weeks before the exam, I get the question, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, will you teach us about the Trendelenburg test to examine varicose veins before the locus? And I say, no. Nobody does that anymore. And after 21 years, I'm still saying, no. We need the Doppler. Someone needs to teach the clinical skills of Doppler. So, and and yeah, you ask the student why, say the university wants it, it's on the curriculum. Okay. Um, Thank you. So that's, that's several questions in one. So I'll, I'll try and break it up. I mean, uh, the, 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 the one thing uh, is that we couldn't guarantee, and that was one of the problems with having key uh, clinical ex experience episodes that students would turn up to. Warrington and not be able to see vascular surgery, for example. So we couldn't put that in. Yeah. Um, so what we've, we've tried to do, and that's true not just for vascular, but other sort of areas, is the, 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 so there is vascular surgery components within the curriculum. Uh, some of it is delivered through the workshops that I was talking about in, in, con, in the consolidation week. Um, and I know it's not going to involve seeing real patients, um, but at least there will be case-based discussions around it. Um, so to some extent, the knowledge component, hopefully, uh, should be covered uh, um, by that. And we've been very, very uh, aware. Because we now have a, a, a curriculum, uh, which is quite detailed, we can see things that they'll see quite easily when they go to their placements and things that they won't. Um, the, um, the second bit is, is of course, a, a, a primary care and general practice. So there'll be elements where, you know, potentially they could see, and I know it's not going to be the same as uh, vascular service, clearly. But, but uh, and, and, and I suppose with, with moving away from the, that uh, rather rigid structure that they could only see it in hospital placements, we're trying to encourage people to say, look, hang on a minute, there are lots of patients out in the community with peripheral vascular disease that they could see uh, and as long as it's in their, in their curriculum. Uh, clinical skills is the other one that uh, um, uh, I think the marriage between the trust uh, clinical skills uh, the, the, and more clinical, clinician involvement in, in on an teaching would get rid of that kind of tests that, that, that unfortunately I think still is taught um, in, in, in our clinical skills uh, unit, uh, which no, no, one, no one does anymore. So it's not a perfect solution. I mean, unless you have a, uh, uh, the other thing of course is for people who are keen to do vascular, so we, we're hoping we'll cover the core, 
competencies that way. It's still not ideal, uh, unless they all rotate through the royal, which, which they won't. Um, um, is, is, of course, the special deplacements that we've got. So for people who are interested, so if you think of recruitment, for example, uh, then that would be an opportunity uh, for you to say, right, okay, we'll be offering vascular surgery two weeks in third year and fourth year. So even if you get five students coming to that, the other five students who may well take up. So I don't know if that answers your question, but. Well, with that, you'd get, you know, maybe 10 students a year, you know, getting some good teaching. I, I suppose this, this covers a sort of more global issue for all of us in the, in the trust is, you might have people in general practice teaching stuff that's 20 years old. Well, that's quite alarming. I mean, we've had that uh, debate with the dermatologists, for example, uh, because they think it's outrageous that general GPs should be teaching dermatology. It's, 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 it's where you fit things, uh, you know, and it, it, it's not even an excuse. It's, it's the reason is that you cannot be the best people in the world putting all the specialties into it. So you've got to cover some of the core competencies in the best way that you can, and, and then uh, sort of rely on. Uh, okay, Vikram, I, th I think it was, it's a brilliant bit of work and, and absolutely fantastic. Um, a big change that's, you know, going to be welcomed by everybody. Um, I'm very interested to see that you've got the, the, the scholarship aspect there. How, have you got a link to incollated degrees, or are they all gone? I mean, obviously, some medical schools have come up with a BMED site as well as, you know, MBCHP. And uh, clearly, if you've got that scientific background already, then surely, you know, you, you know, it's likely the sort of person you're going to produce is going to go on in clinical medicine with a research bias to their practice. Now, uh, you know, you, you know, how strongly are we going to push that? There, we've we've had SSNs, and and that's been the sort of seems they've they've gone. So. How are we going to focus on but, people who want to intercalate? Yeah, well, there's two things, really. Uh, I mean, you're right. Um, I mean, I moved, when I moved from Leeds, uh, I've stopped saying that, actually, when in Leeds we used to do that. It's terrible. Um, but we had up to 60% students intercalating at any given time. I mean, th th that was just the culture of the organization. I think, I think it's fair to say that in Liverpool it's been less, um, uh, a much smaller proportion, and, and we are moving in a big way to increase that, um, uh, working with people like Mark Pritchard, uh, who some of you would know, uh, because he's in charge of the academic sort of training. So he's very concerned that we're not attracting academic trainees um, from, from Liverpool. Um, uh, and there are various ways to do that. One is to sort of expose them more to research institute work in the earlier years, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, but also moving, because we, we intercalate at the end of year four, which, which I think is, is too late. Uh, most other schools intercalate at the end of year three, sometimes even year, year two. Just gives them an opportunity a to uh, uh, to have a longer period of time in the school where they can actually keep keep doing the research uh, work with the with the supervisors, and also the potential of doing a, a, a combined PhD programs, uh, and that's a big problem. Uh, I think I think year four is too late. I mean, because if year four they intercalate, then do a PhD for three four years, they come back to final year, having done their finals in year four, it's the no, it's just not going to work for us. Uh, the BMAT side is an interesting one. We explored that in lots and lots of um, uh, uh, sort of discussions. Uh, the, the problem was that we do our finals in year four. Uh, and that's always seen as best practice nationally, I think, very much. And I think, I think because that allows us that apprenticeship year in year five, but it means that the whole core curriculum has to be squished in four years instead of five, because you can't, you know, you can't have your finals in year four and not finish off your core. Um, and to, to, the only way to do a BMED side was to do it in a block. You, the, the university regulations do not allow it to be done longitudinally. So we had to, we couldn't take eight weeks out of year three, which is what happens, of course, in Sheffield and, 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 and places. Um, the SSMs have gone, but what we've got is a research and scholarship theme. Um, so a lot of the, what used to be the old SSM, so we've got in year one, for example, a structured review, which used to be the SSM one. Year two, it's development of a research proposal, which used to be CTM in year three. You've got a longitudinal research project in year three, um, uh, an opportunity to intercalate in the end of year four at the moment, which will move, and then a research, potential research block in year five. So I think, I think it's getting there. Uh, but but it, it's, it's uh, what we're hoping to do is, is showcase. I mean, there are some very strong clinical research um, areas in, in Liverpool. You know, it's, it's, there's Munir's um, massive sort of uh, personalized medicine and uh, you know, Tom Solomon's uh, uh, sort of global health things. 
And the idea is for them to be able to be exposed to the students in the early years. So students can say, look, I want to really do research with Tom um, and hopefully have some kind of a scholar scheme for, a few, it'll only be a handful of students I think to start with, that we can take them through their, their five years. Uh, with the aim that when they come out of year five, they've got a reasonable portfolio of activity which will make them quite strong candidates applying for ACS. Okay, so I'm gonna ask one, one more question and that is, if you want to identify clinical teachers, why don't you just ask the department who is going to teach in, their de in that department? I mean, I think w one of the problems is, you know, we've got a department of seven people, but there aren't really, out of the seven of us, there aren't many of us who really do want to teach. But if you ask them, if you ask a department, and no one's ever asked us who wants to teach, then you'll find out. Okay, I mean, I, I suppose the thing is the, the mechanism for that is is is, is complex. But I mean, I, th I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I don't know if you have any uh, ideas as to how we could do that. We almost out of time, but, but certainly uh, one of the things that we've been doing um, in the background, very furiously actually, is is to uh, redress this balance between the finance that comes into the trust and goes into directors. It's, it's funny, actually, that, uh, that um, uh, many clinical directors or consultant colleagues are unaware of the very large sums of money that are actually in directorate budgets. So uh, my job for next week, for instance, having moved this agenda along in the last 12 months, is, is actually how education will feature in the divisional agenda. So we are, we are putting education very squarely in the organizational operational framework with metrics that will follow divisional quality metrics that are usually left for patient care, et cetera. So we are putting education at exactly the same level. So there, there are many changes to come, hopefully all, all for the good. But Paul's saying that he's not involved, so that, that immediately... Uh, so we are aware of, that's what I mean, they are involved, uh, but we haven't asked each individual group, that's what we do, is we ask that they take the lead, yeah. and the clinical director will take the lead, and then they 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 will take the lead, Absolutely. Just to summarize, in the same way as a clinical contract goes out to the directorates and the directorates and the divisions uh, uh, evolve a strategy that is internal as, as to how that job will be covered, in the same way we've got an educational contract and that needs to be delivered at directorate and divisional level. So that, that's, that's the structure for the future. Sorry, there's one at the back. Let's take off. Sorry. It was a, a question in relation to the delivering of pathophysiology and the clinical integration of that. I worked at Leeds and as a consultant at Leeds, I was an honorary consultant and delivered some of the year two, three lectures as a pathologist. How are you envisioning that? Because at the moment, pathology has very little input to deliver the clinical pathophysiology sessions. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Tim, uh, Tim Heller has been uh, very involved in the um, in the review. He's been involved uh, in the curriculum for, for a while. Um, there is a funding issue um, that we just negotiated with because it was the apology for some reason is not called as set. Um, so we're trying to identify how we can uh, we can get these people to come out of the to be able to contribute to the teaching. So, so uh, at the moment, it's very much uh, in Tim's hand because he's, he's, he's uh, the academic uh, director. I don't know if, you, if he's involved, uh, like you. Uh, I mean, at the moment, we've devolved it to the leads because he's taken the lead for pathology. But, uh, but, but, but maybe if, if, if it's not going down to the, uh, to the grassroots level, as it were, then we need to remind people uh, that that's what they're meant to do. Because I think I think with the best will, Tim will struggle to deliver the entire 
uh, pathology, and why should he? I mean, if there's expertise and uh, and enthusiasm amongst other people, so so I think I think I think you're right. We need to go back to the leads and say, how are you engaging the clinicians and teaching? So there was a question. Yeah, more comment than one quick question. So I graduated in 2009 from University of Liverpool, and I think it was generally very positive. Um, but I do welcome the new sort of curriculum and looking forward to getting involved through clinical pharmacology. Um, just really one quick question some people were thinking about. Are the reflection weeks going to be still in year five or are they being done with? Done with. No, they were brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they were. <laughs> it was a holiday, wasn't it? <laughs> yes, it's, it's gone. There are no holidays at all in the course. Uh, Vikram, a quick question for you. So h how can we get, say, uncommon themes or... or, or sorry, you mean to... Uh, how can we get themes which are not uh, frequently seen in clinical practice but are quite important into the curriculum? Is there any way of getting voluntary learning blocks or modules, uh, say, something uh, like a rare cancer, which for people hardly ever... Uh, you know, they, they don't get a clinical posting. They graduate without knowledge of such things. And then there is no, uh, you know, there's no way of getting such knowledge. Uh, is there any way of getting, say, voluntary or uh, learning blocks? And, and the other question is, who is the oncology lead for the undergraduate curriculum? Oncology, did you say? Who is the oncology lead? Yeah. Uh, uh, Philip Johnson is uh, taking the lead at the moment. I don't know if people know Philip, but Philip, of course, uh, is, in, is based in Canterbury and, and is part of Liverpool Health Partners. Um, and um, so you're right, oncology is a good example that wasn't explicit in the curriculum. And what we've done is, uh, is Philip has given us a list of sort of lecture type of more formal teaching sessions that will be slotted into, uh, into the earlier years, from years one to three. Uh, and this palliative care oncology block that I talked about in year four should address that uh, that balance. I think I think oncology is a good example. It's got to be there, and it, it is now in the uh, in in the curriculum. Uh, what used to happen in the past, of course, is that you got oncology experience in say, if you went to the women's, you'd get obviously uh, gynec cancer experience and so on. But it's trying to marry the, the, the everything together, so so it becomes a comprehensive block. Thank you. Or done as um, two different like career discovery blocks. So there are those opportunities, and also the speciality placement two-week blocks, where if people are keen to have students and to get them some experience, there are those flexibilities within the course that could be utilised. So if anybody is thinking about that, then please do get in touch with us. I mean, we, we, we're still not full in terms of um, you know the more placements we can get for specialties that are underrepresented in the curriculum, the better it'll be. So, so I think after that, if you could send another reminder, that would be really useful. And it's, it's dynamic. So even if you can't offer it this year, if you can offer it next year, that's great as well. So. Right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, uh,